thank you for coming out on um, a Friday morning at what I know is the, uh, the sort of uncanny valley between the respite of spring break and the um, end of the semester. Um, I'm Maggie Cook, for those of you um, who don't know me, um, I assume all of you at least got an email from me if you're here today. Um, but I also wanted to take this opportunity, um, in addition to welcoming you and uh, thanking all of our speakers uh, for coming, um, to say a word in thanks for our sponsors for this event. Um, the Center for Arts and Humanities here at Colby, uh, the Rare Book School at the University of Virginia, and the English Department here at Colby. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with uh, Rare Book School and with the Mellon program um, in critical bibliography that brings um, several of our speakers uh, here today, including Sonia Drimmer and Elisa Strahov, who we'll hear from uh, momentarily, and then Joel Anderson, uh, who will be speaking later on in the day. Um, there's some materials on the table uh, in the back, along with schedules for today's events, uh, and I would encourage you to take a look at those during one of our coffee breaks. Um, throughout the day, the other uh, contingency that I need to thank is the students in my uh, senior seminar in the history of the book. Uh, who will be serving as co-facilitators with me today. Um, and so I want to thank them in advance, and at this point, turn it over to um, Aya and Caitlin, uh, who will be helping out with our first uh, session. So, welcome. So thank you, everybody, for being here today. Um, we just wanted to introduce our amazing panelists this morning. Um, Sonia Drimmer is Assistant Professor of Medieval Art at UMass Amherst. She is currently writing a book entitled Image and Illusion, Illuminators and the Making of Middle English Literature from 1403 to 1476, which has received support from the National Endowment for the Humanities, the British Academy, and others. Her most recent article, Failure Before Print, can be found in Viator. Today she will be presenting Beyond Dullness, Varieties of the Dating Experience. <coughs> Anita Sabo completed her PhD in Spanish at Yale University in 2014 and began working at Colby College that same year. Her research explores how bookmaking technology and rhetorical formulations of authority contribute to the notions of authorship that we perceive in medieval literary works. In her current, <clears throat> in her current book project, she's investigating these notions of authorship in the works of the 14th century Spanish author Juan Manuel. Elisa Menestrojo is assistant professor of English at Marquette University. Her research focus is on Anglo-French literary and political relations during the Hundred Years' War. She has published on Chaucer, Medieval Lyric, Manuscript Anthology, and the Literary History of Burgundy. Today she'll be presenting Reading Chaucer's Annalita and Arcite, or Why Manuscript Layout Matters. <laughs> Thank you very much for that introduction. And I should start by saying that I have my phone, not because I'll be texting, but because I want to keep to time and I don't have a watch. So <laughs> I am I'm so happy to be here. And above all, I'm looking forward to hearing everybody else's presentations, which look tantalizing. Uh, my own presentation today comes from a chapter that I'm currently writing for the book that was mentioned by Caitlin. And it is about a manuscript containing poetry by John Lidgett. Now, there are a number of you in this room who may never have heard of John Lidgett, but he was one of the most widely read English poets of the 15th century, although his reputation has suffered somewhat in the years since. And I believe that the reason why his, or one of the reasons why his reputation has suffered, is because his poetry is no longer read in the majestic manuscript context in which it was encountered in the 15th century. So uh, what I want to do right now is just start out by giving you a sense of what people have had to say about John Lidgett in the years since he was alive. It is routine to express, uh, to, excuse me, it is routine to flaunt one's expertise in John Lidgett by relishing his defaults. Dullness is arguably the most common alleged against him, but he was a voluminous, prosaic, and dribbling monk as well as a stupid and disgusting author. <laughs> He is also often tedious and languid, his efforts intolerably lame. And you know, even Lydgate himself chastened himself for his own uh, ignorance and rudeness. So people have taken him at his word. <laughs> Char 
characteriz uh, characterizations of Lydgate's poetic deficiencies form something of a genre unto itself. And although Derek Pearsall did not inaugurate the genre, he is arguably its most enthusiastic contributor, the modern champion of Lydgate, who has resurrected the study of his corpus only to pummel it at every single opportunity. <laughs> Early in his career, Pearsall opined that when Lydgate has to select for himself, he is undiscriminating, and the result is flatulence. I've always wanted to refer to authors as farty, but anyway. Uh, this is Pearsall just warming up, and as he eases into his exercises, he marvels. No poet can mark time with such profuse demonstrations of energy, can so readily make 20 words do the work of one. <laughs> Sometimes it's difficult to slow down the process of the mind to the breathless snail's pace of his verse. Forty years of scholarly devotion have not changed his mind. Here is Pearsall in 2005. Lydgate's halting versification, his turgid syntax, his repetitiveness, his long-windedness and verbosity, are not matters of debate with friends like these. <laughs> Yet these slanders tend to lose their purchase when Lincoln's works are brought into contact with circumstance and material situation. The central object of my talk today is a manuscript that belies the lumbering lassitude that these insults contend. Quite the contrary, this manuscript had sufficient vigor to motivate three successive generations of owners to return to this manuscript repeatedly over three quarters of a century. The manuscript, uh, you're looking at one page opening up from it now, contains Lydgate's very long poem, The Troy Book, and his less long poem, The Siege of Thebes. The former was written at the behest of Prince Henry of Wales, later Henry V of England. Uh, it's the story of the Trojan War, and the latter is an account of the conflict between Oedipus's sons for control of Thebes which Lincoln actually frames as an additional Canterbury tale. It's one of the earliest forms that I know of, of fan fiction. Mm -hmm. The manuscript, as you see by those dates up there, was begun and left incomplete between 1457 and 1461. It was continued around 1490, and it was complemented with further texts and illumination again around 1525. Reassessments of Lydgate have shown that, despite the corpulence of his verse, he was in fact an agile ducker and weaver, preparing poems not just for present instances, but likewise with future contingencies in mind. But scholars have yet to extend these arguments to the illuminated context in which Lydgate's mega poems like the Troy Book are most often found. And this is what I will be doing today. My premise in this paper is that Lydgate built variety into the manuscript copies of his works, a variety that reached out beyond the moment of his poetry's making to exert agency on future scenarios. The original opening page to this manuscript, what we're looking at now, embodies the essence of variation that adheres in Lidget's work. On this page, the viewer encounters a moment in time not accounted for in the prologue to the poem. Set above the first line to the Troy book, so you can see it there, O Mighty Mars. Set above that first line the, uh, um, is a large column miniature that frames the image of a king in majesty. At the king's feet are two kneeling figures, identifiable by the coats of arms that adorn their garments and the mottos that embroider the page. So here are these guys' the mottos over here, and there's more down here. Uh, what we're seeing is William Herbert on the left, he was the first Earl of Pembroke, and his wife Anne Devereux, whom he had married in 1455. A very strange scene to encounter here. This is not your typical image of book presentation, and no book is present. Instead, shown in double genuflection, their hands raised in supplication, the Herberts submit themselves to Henry VI, receiving grace from the king, who had pardoned Herbert twice for treason in 1457 and 1460. So this guy had committed treason, or was accused of it, and was pardoned twice. What better way to thank such magnanimity than to commemorate it in a book that contains a poem originally composed for that king's father and which praises his father lavishly? Ultimately, the Herberts really shouldn't have bothered. In March of 1461, Henry VI was deposed and work on this manuscript halted. Of course, neither William nor Anne, nor the king before whom they kneel, has any direct relationship to Lydgate's poem. 
And while their presence helps us to answer the question of when this manuscript was made, it really only produces more questions. What does this act of pardon have to do with the Troy book? Why would this book be an appropriate vehicle for such a commemoration? What were an illuminator and scribe to make of the brief to tack such a targeted statement onto the gate's opening verses to the Troy book? Whereas miniatures that preface other texts are often tautologous, this opening page introduces variation. In tautologous scenes of book presentation, or what I'm calling tautologous scenes, the image of a book passing between two parties contains within it a reminiscence or aspirational portrait of the object that is its own support, that is, the book. So it's um, almost a mise en beam, right? It's contained in a book that is represented here. We can see this redundancy in an earlier copy of the Troy book in which Lickett presents his work to King Henry V. Similarly, locking the text into a specific moment frontispiece or prefatory miniatures are often, from the perspective of the book, biographical. They are about the moments the book traveled between donor and recipient, if it's a presentation miniature, the instance of a book's conception, if it's an author portrait, or the time of an event that the book itself recounts, if it's a narrative scene. But here, right, in the royal manuscript, is an image in which both the book and its author are moot. Such a scenario could only have been imagined in a literary environment in which it was appropriate for personal dispatches to piggyback on the messages of someone else's text. This exploitation, however, is not so much wanton opportunism on the Herbert's part as it is actually attentive to the long-term expectations written into the Troy book by its author and by manuscript producers. These long-term expectations are the essence of all exemplary literature. That is, that in reading about and looking at images of the past, audiences will equip themselves with the knowledge to cope with events in the present and the future. Lidgett simply takes this idea to an extreme. For example, the past takes up residence in Lidgett's own activities as a translator and poet. And in a passage from the prologue, that would probably make Derek Pearsall break out in hives, <laughs> Livy piles diverse systems for measuring time upon one another, all to tell us that he began work on the Troy book at exactly 4 o'clock in the afternoon on Monday, October 31st, 1412. And here's how he tells this information to us. I'm going to read it aloud in modern English translation. And of the time to make mention when I began this translation, it was the year, true to say, 14 of his father's reign meaning Henry IV's reign. The time of year soon to conclude, when 20 degrees was Phoebus's altitude, the hour when he made his, ste his steeds draw his rosy chariot low under the yaw, to bathe his beams in the wavy sea, braided like gold as men might see, passing the border of our Océan, and Lucina of color pale and wan, her cold arising in October began to fight away the darkness of the frosty night, in the midst of the scorpion, and Venus began in the west to go down, to hasten her course among the morning gray, and Lucifer to drive the night away, is beckoned then the day's herald, to put our hemisphere out of peril, with harbingers of Phoebus to rise brightly out of Queen Persephone's territory, where Pluto dwells the dark region, where the Furies have their mansion, till soon after Apollo desires not to delay in Sagittarius to remain. Mustered in this calculation is a parade of metrics from the regnal year, solar elevation, and the seasonal clock, to the Julian calendar, and the time of myth. Liggett may be flexing his vocabulary here, but he is also giving us a digest of his historiographic methodology. In short, none of the different ways of measuring time is prioritized over any other. The result is that each cultural matrix invoked has as much authority as any other to inform the reader's experience and interpretation of any given passage. The Troy book, then, declaredly about a specific set of events in ancient time, has the capacity to resonate infinitely with future scenarios. Excuse me. <coughs> you may say 4 p.m. on October 31st, but, that's, but to me, that's when the sun is at so many degrees over the horizon, and when X constellation rules the sky, and to a kid it might be when you put on a costume. Uh, and when I teach this idea about temporality to my students, I say, 
for you, September is the beginning of another year. But for someone who's not going to school, September is just when you start to wear cardigans. Now, turning this equation back to the opening page of the royal manuscript, this may once have been the moment of Lydgate's presentation to Henry V. <coughs> but like the repeating cycle of the seasons, poetry recurs every time it is read. So this is also the moment of the Herbert's pardon by Henry VI and the gratitude they express by gifting him this book. What I'm getting at here is that the text itself and this opening page built variation into this manuscript, which invited further individualized, individualized responses in the future. <coughs> so how then does the remainder of this manuscript evidence a response to the variation encouraged by this opening page? As I mentioned earlier, the manuscript was produced in three campaigns. So let me return to this now and describe those campaigns in greater detail. When the Herberts commissioned this manuscript as a gift for Henry VI, they paid for a book that would contain 24 miniatures, 12 miniatures to accompany the Troy book, and 12 miniatures to accompany the Siege of Thebes. <coughs> However, only five of these miniatures were initially completed, what you see here. I'm also showing you my horrible power, to the uh, Photoshop skills. <clears throat> oh my god, thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. Uh, so only five of these miniatures were initially completed. These are the five miniatures that were allotted to introduce the prologue and all but one of the five books or five chapters of the Troy book. In other words, the miniatures that were painted are those which appear as part of the program of illumination in other earlier manuscripts of the Troy book. Unfinished were the additional miniatures that had never before been represented in other manuscripts of the Troy book, and the entire, miniature, uh, the entire cycle for the Siege of Thebes, which had never before been illuminated at all. Basically, here's what I think happened. The illuminator went through the manuscript, uh, completing images for which he could locate a model or which were in his exemplar, uh, and leaving the others aside, which he would get to later because they required more thought and planning. But before he could get to these, the Herberts recalled their book, knowing that there was no need to flatter a king with a gift since that king had just been deposed. <laughs> Yet, the Herbert family did what I think anyone in this room who had sunk money into a stalled project would do. They recouped their losses and kept the investment for themselves. But here's the thing. The book did not simply sit on a shelf or molder away in the attic over the succeeding sec uh, decades. Rather, Three of the remaining 19 miniatures, one, two, three, uh, that were incomplete were painted by a professional illuminator, and based on their style, it looks like this happened in roughly 1490. There is something completely strange about this. For one, the miniatures are not contiguous. The artist jumped around, and it's possible that the manuscript's owners directed him to do so. And of course, this leads to the question, why these three miniatures? And you can see them right here. I can only hazard a guess now, but what unites them thematically is their depiction of the Greeks' treachery and its consequences. The first miniature portrays the storm that, so on the left, portrays the storm that was sent to punish the Greeks for waging war on the Trojans. The second two illustrate the story of the Trojan horse, uh, the Greeks' ultimate act of deception and foul play. But identifying this thematic coherence only leads to more questions, one of which is, why were the miniatures that deal with these themes painted around this time? We know that by this date, the manuscript was in the possession of another family, of the Percy family. So it's possible that the illuminations were added upon this manuscript's transition from the Herbert household to the Percy household. And this happened probably in the year 1476, because the two people kneeling in that initial miniature, they had a daughter named Maud, and Maud married into the Percy family. They lived in the north of England. But one of the things that I don't want to do is dive into the rabbit's hole of historical events in an attempt to track down precisely, precisely the right one that would seem to have prompted these additions. All it would be is speculation at this stage. So let me leave this hanging here for the time being and move on to the third and final phase of this manuscript's production. Sometime in the first quarter of the 16th century, work resumed on the royal manuscript Cementing its status is a monument to the indissoluble relationship between the Percy family and the throne. At this stage, all of the remaining miniatures were painted, which is to say the remaining four in the Troy book, 
and the entirety of the cycle illustrating the Siege of Thebes. Two miniatures that were painted in 1490, right over here, were at this time misbound, and that's where they remain to this day. But the Percy family did not simply contract an artist to round out unfinished work. In addition, they hired their household secretary, William Pierce, to add a substantial number of texts that include, so I'm doing this, this is the actual order in the manuscripts. At the beginning of the manuscripts, they, uh, he added John Lydgate's own testament, a literary palinode. Following this manuscript's core of the Troy Book and Siege of Thebes, so what you see here, are William Cornish's A Treatise Between Information and Truth, Skelton's On the Death of the Earl of Northumberland, so one of the family members of the household who owned this manuscript, the anonymous L'Assemble de Dieu, which is actually in Middle English despite its title, Lickett's The Reigns of the Kings of England, a description of arms of various kings entitled The Blazer of the Arms of Kings, William per Pierce's own chronicle of the Percy family, composed sometime between 1516 and 1523, and finally, my favorite piece, proverbial and moral treatises, uh, ver uh, verses transcribed from the walls and ceilings of the Percy's own homes. <coughs> now, the Percy's had a substantial manuscript collection, and in fact, their library, which they called Paradise, was tricked out with an elaborate shelving system that caused a visitor, John Leland, in the uh, 16th century to comment. One thing I liked exceedingly in one of the towers that was a study called Paradise, where it was a closet in the middle of eight squares latticed about. And at the top of every square was a desk led to set books on coffers within them. And these seemed as joined hard to the top of the closet. And yet by pulling one or all would come down, rest high in panels, uh, and serve for desks to lay books upon, excuse me, planks. I think what we can gather from this description of the Percy's library is the importance of display when it came to their books but also the fact that if they wanted these other texts produced, they certainly had the means to have them bound together or individually as separate volumes. Why have them added to this a 75-year-old manuscript? The answer to this question brings me to my conclusion. Bound into this manuscript is a 75-year-long dossier of a family's own history tied to the history of the crown. From William Herbert and Anne Devereux's perpetual pardon by Henry VI, down to the death of one of the manuscript's 16th century owners, alongside a pedigree of the kings of England. But these additions do not just reveal the preferences of a family to whom the combined manuscript was greater than the sum of its parts. More importantly, these additions take up the brief issued on the initial opening page of this manuscript and lodged in the very fabric of the Gates verse. The art historian Michael Ann Holly has argued brilliantly that representational practices encoded in works of art continue to be encoded in their commentaries. She elaborates this comment to say that enfolded in objects, and we can include text in this, are rhetorical mandates that legislate what can plausibly be said about them and what can plausibly be done with them. As a succession of commentaries on itself, of what we might call bibliographical auto-exegesis, <laughs> the royal manuscript repeatedly reifies inflections of its natal self, the germ of which lay in the Lydgatian verse at channels and the initial campaign by the Herberts to materialize it. John Lydgate may well have been a dull poet, but what he and the illuminators who illustrated his poems offered was an invitation to sharpen this dullness with variety, an invitation that generations took up with brio. Thank you. like to thank Megan Cook and her students in the History of the Book Seminar for organizing this event and for inviting me here today. Um, the title of my talk is Bound for Greatness, The Legacy of Don Juan Manuel, and this is coming from a larger book project that I've been working on, on the collected works uh, of Juan Manuel, a 14th century Castilian author. Uh, but I'm going to start in present times in 2016 and take us back to the 14th century and go from there. In our information age, scholars and cultural critics have argued time and again that the technologies that allow us to experience a text shape the ways we read and think. 
Nicholas Carr, in an Atlantic article titled, Is Google Making Us Stupid? <laughs> laments that the practice of internet browsing creates readers who are more superficial and easily distracted. But Carr also points out that it's natural for new technologies to inspire pushback, in spite of their many benefits. For example, some Italian humanists bemoaned the invention of the printing press, fearing that it would make books too easily accessible and encourage intellectual laziness. Um, I think we can say that that hasn't necessarily happened. <laughs> I would like to propose that we take these anxieties as a jumping off point for an exploration of how readers perceive an author in and through a material text. My approach is a case study of an author well known in the Spanish literary tradition, the Castilian nobleman Juan Manuel, who lived from 1282 to 1348. In Juan Manuel's most famous work, The Conde Luca Nord, uh, first circulated in 1335, the titular protagonist, Count Luca Nord, relates different problems from his daily life and asks his advisor, Patronio, for advice. And Patronio counsels him using exemplary stories that mirror each problem. This format of a frame narrative, or stories within a story, is perhaps most familiar to modern readers from Boccaccio's Decameron, in which uh, some young people tell stories as they're waiting for the danger of the plague to pass, or Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, in which pilgrims on route to Canterbury tell stories to pass the time. These three works have something else in common. They were all composed during the 14th century, widely acknowledged as a watershed moment for notions of authorship. In the words of Roger Chartier, and I quote, the 14th century was a time of inventions fundamental for written works in the vernacular. The invention of the author as the creator of a work that expressed his or her unique genius. The invention of literature as an object for reflection and as the very matter of the poetic gesture. And the invention of the book as a means for presenting the work and the author in their full individuality. To this statement, we should add several caveats. On the one hand, before the 14th century, some works, such as the Vidas, or literary biographies, of Provencal poets did celebrate the individuality of the author. On the other, some scholars would argue that the concept of the original or creative author did not emerge until the Romantic period, with only fragmentary precedents in medieval and early modern works. Nonetheless, I believe we can speak of an overall paradigm shift which we can visualize using manuscript illuminations from before and after 1300. And I imagine that my fellow panelists will have a lot to say about these illuminations. In this image from the Libro de los Fuegos, um, authorship is depicted as the collaborative effort of a group of craftsmen who are defined not by their individuality, but by their social roles as designated in their garb. They are shown with the instruments of book production including um, a stylus to write with and a knife to scrape errors, to scrape errors off of parchment. In this mid-14th century depiction of Guillaume de Machaut, um, the poet holds a scroll and stylus and looks off into the distance, perhaps captured in a moment of creative inspiration. By the 15th century, we see more of the type of illuminations um, in which authors present their completed work uh, to an audience or patron. For example, here we have Geoffrey Chaucer invitingly holding open a book at the uh, start of his Canterbury Tales. Or Giovanni Boccaccio presenting his work to a group of admiring ladies. Um, and again, Christine de Pizan presenting a completed manuscript to Queen Isabella of Bavaria. Unfortunately, um, one of the manuscripts I'm going to be talking about today, uh, a manuscript of one of my most completed works, was supposed to have illuminations that were never completed, probably because uh, the commissioners ran out of resources to do so. Um, but we do have this possible portrait of Juan Manuel from a cathedral in Murcia, Spain, just to get a sense of what he might have been like. Juan Manuel occupies a foundational role in the Spanish literary tradition because he is one of the first authors writing in Castilian who both attaches his name to his works and claims full moral responsibility for their contents. Most of his predecessors and contemporaries either remained anonymous, claimed to, claimed to be mere translators, or played an authorial role somewhere between an author and a commissioner or patron. But Juan Manuel foregrounds his own authorial role to an unusual extent, particularly in his prologues. In what scholars call the general prologue, 
Coleman Lowe claims to have commissioned a manuscript copy of his complete corpus, which he allegedly edited in his own hand and had deposited in the same Dominican monastery where he was to be buried. The original manuscript is not extant. Legend has it that it was destroyed in a fire. Um, however, a 15th century manuscript of Coleman Lowe's collected works, known as uh, Manuscript S in the scholarship, has preserved the general prologue in seven of Juan Manuel's eight extant works. In the general prologue, uh, an excerpt of which you see here, Juan Manuel's authorial persona, Don Juan, introduces his works and provides a synthesis of his ideas about authorship. And I quote, I, Don Juan, have seen that in the copying process, often one word will be put in place of another, either because of the ignorance of the scribe or because the letters resemble one another, such that the whole intention and meaning is changed, and the one who wrote the book is unjustly betrayed. So, to guard against this as much as I can, I had this volume made, in which are written all the books I have composed up until now." End quote. Juan Manuel's prologue, as well as the gesture of collecting his works into a single volume, indicates that he views the preservation of his works as problematic. Writing a century before the invention of the printing press, Juan Manuel lamented the instability of the manuscript culture in which he lived, fearing that incompetent scribes would divide up his works, misattribute them to other authors, or introduce errors into the text. By binding his works into one authoritative volume, he hoped to avoid this undesirable fate. Since Juan Manuel's original manuscript has been lost, we are left with S. Um, which is possibly an incomplete copy of this single author codex, but we can't be sure. Whether or not this is true, the organizational features of the surviving manuscript can tell us much about how its compiler wished to, to portray Juan Manuel's authorship. Three features of S in particular, typically absent from modern editions of the Conde de Canor, highlight Juan Manuel's authorial role. First, as we have seen, the manuscript begins with the general prologue. Uh, you can see the manuscript version here, in which the first person narrator and author figure, Don Juan, introduces his entire corpus and lists the titles of all the works he has composed. Additionally, in a rhetorical move that anticipates Chaucer's retraction, Don Juan asks the reader to forgive any shortcomings of his works, which are due not to his intentions, which were good, but to his lack of intelligence. Second, S collects works of several genres. In addition to the exemplary tales of the Conde de Lucanor and their accompanying poetic verses, there are works and prose on history, hunting, theology, and knighthood. Sylvia Hua, speaking of Guillaume de Machaut in the French lyrical narrative tradition, writes that in the 14th century, the compilation of a particular author's complete works, quote, would have been the exception rather than the rule. It is therefore extremely significant when we do find examples of generically diverse author corpora." Although Juan Manuel's works do not exhibit the same range of poetic form that Guillaume de Machaut's do, they are generically diverse, and their main unifying principle is this author figure, Don Juan. Third, most of the works in S are introduced by a prologue that specifies how the text should be divided into smaller parts. For example, the prologue to the Conde Lucanor announces 50 exemplary stories. Another work contains 100 chapters, and so forth. Such round numbers often had symbolic meaning in the Middle Ages, but I invite you to interpret them also as an attempt to close Juan Manuel's works off to interpretations. <coughs> the compiler of S encourages future scribes to remain faithful to their exemplar by placing the number of stories and chapters in the text of the prologues rather than in paratextual rubrics, which are often set off uh, by a different color ink and tend to be changed around by scribes copying and recopying the text. <laughs> the great irony of all of Don Juan's safeguards and protests is that the fear expressed in the general prologue inevitably came true, and the author's plan for his work was, in his words, betrayed. <laughs> Some sympathy for Don Juan here. Um, even in X, which most scholars consider to be uh, the most authoritative copy of the Conde de Canor, an extra story has crept in for a total of 51. In other extant manuscripts, the Conde de Canor circulated on its own without the prologues, um, or in compilations with works by other authors. Often, the order of the stories was changed, stories were added or subtracted, or the rhyming couplets concluding each story 
were taken out of context and presented in a list. For example, this 16th century manuscript takes the verses out of their narrative frame and does not attribute their authorship to Dauphin Manuel, denying the author his role as compiler, interpreter, and poet. However, in other ways, Juan Manuel's attempt to establish himself as an author through codicological means evidently took hold. For instance, you might have noticed at the top of this manuscript, Nota Diego Garcia, or Diego Garcia Notes. Um, this, as Jonathan Burgoyne has demonstrated, is a signal that the verse immediately following it is an interpolation. It doesn't appear in the Conde de Um Some unknown guy named Diego Garcia decided to add it in. Thus, although the scribe of the manuscript omits the author's name, he does call attention to interpolations and apocryphal editions that do not belong to his authoritative source text. While the general prologue only survives in S, all the medieval and early modern manuscripts of the Conde de Ganard are preceded by a short text known as the anti-prologue. <laughs> these are all scholarly names, by the way. Yeah. The general prologue, the anti-prologue. Everyone <coughs> did not put these names to his prologues. Um, the anti-prologue is a recapitulation of the general prologue in the third person, um, and it confers authority on Juan Manuel almost as effectively as its model. It provides the author's name and gives a list of titles of his works, describes the care with which he had them copied, and exculpates him for any deficiencies that the reader might encounter. Um, you can actually see the list of works a little better in this 15th century manuscript because they're set off by, um, by red divisions. Evidence from two 16th century collections, one manuscript, one print, shows that in spite of the treachery of transmission, Juan Manuel's concept of authorship ultimately prevailed. The editors of each collection bestow upon Don Juan the title of autor, author, which appears nowhere in the older manuscripts, and for that matter is hardly ever used in Castilian to refer to a vernacular author before the year 1350. The 16th century manuscript shown here is notable for being the only one besides S to compile works other than the Golden de Ganor. It begins with one of these lesser works, which you can see here, rather than with one of the introductory prologues. However, toward the end of the codex, the scribe transitions between two works by paraphrasing the anti-prologue, and in doing so, provides a list of Juan Manuel's works, you can see in the red bracket. He also adds a paragraph on Juan Manuel's lineage and in doing so, refers to him as autor de estos libros, or author of these books. These additions appear to have been important to a contemporary reader of the manuscript as well, as you can see by the marginal annotations. Um, this one has not survived in the digital copy, but it says del componedor de este libro, on the composer of this work. Um, and the note above, the top marginal note, says la genealogía de los hombres. Uh, the genealogy of the Bokhama These additions and marginal notes signal that by the 13th century, the author's name and lineage have taken on greater importance for readers of uh, vernacular works. The treatment of the author in the 1575 print edition of the Conde de Bernard, edited by the Andalusian humanist Gonzalo Argote de Molina, confirms this theory. Argote de Molina makes some changes to the presentation of Juan Manuel's works including significant rearrangement of the exemplary stories. But he simultaneously aggrandizes the figure of the author by including uh, a biography of Dauphin Manuel with, as you can see, a list of his works, um, an account of his descendants down to the present, and finally, a discourse by Gonzalo Argote de Molina on the Castilian poetry contained in this book. Argote de Molina publishes neither the general prologue nor the anti-prologue, but he does echo their sentiments in a prologue of his own, his dedication to the curious reader. And I quote, Last year at the court of his majesty, there came to my hands this book of Count Lucanor. And since it was by such an illustrious author, I became interested in reading it. The only thing that gave me sorrow was to see that the book I had was ruined in many places by fault of the scribe. Admittedly, Argote de Molina was motivated by a desire to please his patron, powerful descendant of Juan Manuel, but he nonetheless exalts the author for his edifying content and pleasing style, and carries forward some of the original approach to authorship expressed in Juan Manuel's general prologue. 
Claude Manuel, in the initial composition and transmission of his works, used the technologies at his disposal to encourage scribes and readers to treat his works with the same care that those of, Latin, of venerated Latin authors received. These techniques could not achieve the author's stated goal to preserve the whole intention and meaning of his works. But then again, no technology, even in the age of mechanical reproduction and beyond, can really ensure that. <clears throat> what Juan Manuel did achieve, however, was the preservation of his singular notion of authorship, which has been physically bound with the text of his works to varying degrees since the mid 14th century. Today, in addition to dozens of print editions of the Conde de Ganar and several author biographies, Juan Manuel's complete works have been published in three different modern editions that continue to echo his views on authorship. The scholar Fernando Gomez Redondo, reviewing Jose Manuel Becoa's 1983 edition, writes that, and I quote, for the first time, the dream of two men has come true. One from his youth sought to dedicate his best efforts and hopes to editing the complete work of Don Juan Manuel. The latter, the other, would have liked his works to remain together permanently, forming that complete identity that he intended to leave of himself. This rhetoric suggests a sort of inevitability to Juan Manuel's legacy of the royal control. But as we have just seen, the vicissitudes of this legacy become apparent when we examine the textual history of the Conde de Ganar. In the wake of mass digitization of medieval manuscripts, we are facing what we might call a revolution in the accessibility of manuscript studies to a broad and diverse group of scholars. When I began researching the textual history of Juan Manuel's works, only one out of eight manuscripts was digitized, and another was available in a facsimile. To consult the others, scholars had to visit the archives in Madrid, in Oviedo, and in Santander. Today, the opposite is true. Only one of Don Juan Manuel's manuscripts is not available, um, either in digital editions, in facsimiles, or in one case, in um, a paleographic transcription that has been published. I think we can say this is an unambiguously positive change, and uh, Professor Cook's students would probably agree, as they've been working with digitized manuscripts from the comfort of Miller Library all semester. But as with any new technological support for texts, there are some downsides. For example, some libraries and archives have begun restricting access to manuscripts that are available digitally, citing their fragile condition and the need for preservation. Scholars working the archive circuit in Madrid know that librarians and archivists can often be persuaded by the need to study the watermarks stamped in medieval and early modern paper. If you use the word watermarks, they'll let you see the manuscripts. <laughs> <laughs> but watermarks aren't the only feature of the physical codex that we miss out on when we use digital copies of manuscripts. And we need to be conscious of the other properties that only the physical objects can afford. The size and heft of a book, like S, uh, which is quite large, and uh, the digital image doesn't give a sense of that. <laughs> the feel of the pages, the luxuriousness of the binding, um, and other material characteristics of which we might not even be aware. I hope to have suggested something of the role that materiality plays in how we perceive and acquire knowledge, not just about authorship, but about many uh, categories related to the production and interpretation of texts. As readers in the digital age, we make choices all the time about the material texts we read. For example, should I go to the library and peruse the stacks, or should I just consult the catalog from the comfort of my own computer. Um, will I teach the Conde de Ganor in English translation despite its unattractive typeface? <laughs> Is it time to give up on physical books entirely and just buy an e-reader? Incidentally, you can get a copy of the Penguin edition of the Conde de Ganor in modernized Spanish for your Kindle. I may have my personal preferences, but by no means do I think the digital texts are ruining the way we do scholarship and especially not making us stupid. Instead, I believe they give us as readers new opportunities to consider how the material text impacts our ways of reading, thinking, and seeing the world. Thank you. I'm an old school person who does not have a PowerPoint, so we can just send it. Um, but I want to join the other two presenters in thanking uh, Professor Cook so very much, particularly since I'm the one who came the furthest all the way from Milwaukee. Uh, so in thanking Professor Cook uh, for this marvelous opportunity 
This is uh, a very new work. This comes from the final uh, chapter. This will be in the final chapter of my book, which is called Politics of Translation, Lyric Form and the Francophone Author in Late Medieval Europe. Um, and let's get right into it. Famously and bafflingly, the only known acknowledgement of Chaucer's poetry in his own lifetime does not come from England. It belongs to a French poet, Estache de Champs, who, infamously, called Chaucer a grand translateur, a great translator, who translates from French into good English. An odd phrase. Yet only a decade after his death, Thomas Hockley would call Chaucer the first founder of our fair language, and his father in the Regiment of Princes. Similarly, John Lidgate, whom we just heard about, would claim one generation later in his Fall of Princes that Chaucer is the main poet of Britain and the quote unquote lodestar of our language, the navigating star of our language. The glowing praise of these later contemporaries and successors, and their emphasis on Chaucer's central role in the elevation of English as a literary language, set Chaucer on his path to dominate our university syllabi as one of the greats, if not one of the founding, sort of founding greats of the English canon. Such a complete shift in attitude in less than one generation is remarkable. It is tempting to say, what with Chaucer himself choosing to write entirely in English, and legislation like the Statute of Pleadings as early as 1362, requiring, if not exactly enforcing, the use of English in the legal courts, and English military dominance in the Hundred Years' War in the early 15th century, that Chaucer's canonization is the inevitable result of the rise of English linguistico-cultural supremacy. But that narrative doesn't work quite so neatly. Actually, inventories, book lists, wills, and codicils of late 14th and early to mid 15th century English book owners overwhelmingly list French literature. Indeed, in 1425, John of Bedford purchased, or really seized, the entirety of the French Royal Library and had by 1429 at least partially shipped it across the Channel to England. Hockley and Lydgate were themselves absolutely steeped in French fare. Hockleaf translated Christine de Pizan, Lydgate translated numerous anonymous shorter French works, and both translated Guillaume de de Gilda. It is really quite striking that Chaucer should be elevated to critical acclaim as an English poet during a period of immense cultural predisposition for French rather than English reading material, and by figures who are themselves translators of French material into English. We recall that Chaucer's only praise in his own lifetime comes from his French contemporary, Eustache Deschamps, who calls him a great translator, working in good English. Chaucer is then praised after his death by Hockleave and Lydgate, fellow countrymen and fellow translators, again for his English. No scholar to my knowledge has ever considered these responses to Chaucer as part of a single narrative of Chaucerian reception, not least because it is French medievalists who work on Deschamps, and English medievalists who work on Hockleave and Lydgate. But why shouldn't we, when all three of these figures are French speakers devouring French literature? After all, they're all commenting on the exact same thing, Chaucer's use of English in a Francophone cultural landscape. I propose that we start to unravel some of this by looking closely at a criminally understudied figure with a key role in this whole canonization process, the scribe and bibliophile John Shirley. From the 1420s to the 1440s, Shirley heavily anthologized Chaucer's work, and it's thanks to his attributions that we admit several key works to the Chaucer canon. Shirley's anthologies went on to influence the makeup of numerous later 15th century Chaucerian collections and 16th century Chaucerian complete works editions. But as I'm about to show, Shirley's arrangement and presentation of Chaucer's work specifically of Annalide and Arcite, The Complaint of Mars, The Complaint of Venus, and Fortune, actually testified to his profound interest in canonizing Chaucer for Chaucer's relationship to contemporary French culture. If we look closely at how Shirley presents Chaucer's work, we realize that, just like Deschamps, one generation before, Shirley is also canonizing Chaucer for being a translator from French into English. As we will further see, a closer look at Shirley, a closer look at the manuscripts, encourages us to reconsider both how we read works as presented in modern editions and how we construct retrospective literary histories. 
As I'm about to show you, Shirley emphasizes the Frenchness of Chaucer's poetry in various ways. In Cambridge Trinity College, R320, an anthology of Chaucer, Lydgate, and others, copied in circa 1430 to 1432, Shirley places a section of the longer work we now call Annalita and Arcite as the very first Chaucerian item in his anthology. This section is known as Annalita's Complaint, or lines 211 to 350 in the modern Riverside Chaucer edition of Annalita and Arcite, so the second half of, the, of, of Annalita and Arcite. And it features Annalita as the speaker, voicing a lament over Arcite's betrayal. It comes as the 24th item in the sequence of 23 French poems, out of a total 34 French items in the whole manuscript. So out of 34 French items, 23 are copied in a sequence, and Annalita's complaint is the 24th poem, and the first Chaucerian poem in the anthology. After these 23 French poems, Annalita's complaint occurs with the following rubric. I'm going to read them in modern English, right? Well, there's the Middle English is there for you. Take heed, sirs, I pray you, of this complaint of Annalita, Queen of Carthage, that piteously complains about the fickleness of Don Arcite, Englished by Geoffrey Chaucer, in the best and most sedatoricius manner, the most uncouth meter of rhetorical figures and rhymes that have ever been used before today. Read and ascertain the truth. Shirley identifies Annalita's complaint as a work that Chaucer has Englished. Englished literally means to make or render into English, or to translate into English. It occurs in such a context, for example, in the prologue to the Wycliffe Bible. Shirley further emphasizes this Englishing as being in the best and most rhetoricious manner, and in the most uncouth meter rhetorical figures and rhymes. Now, the term uncouth occurs in contemporary context, such as Chaucer's own writing, Langland's Pierce Plowman, and Lydgate's Fall of Princes, among many others, with the following meanings, unknown, unfamiliar, strange, unusual, uncommon, foreign, alien, not native. In this rubric to the first Chaucerian item in the anthology then, Shirley strongly emphasizes at once the foreignness and the rhetorical eloquence of Chaucer's poetic project. We know also that this emphasis on Chaucer's association with Frenchness and with foreignness is achieved by separating the complaint from the rest of Annalita and Arcite. The opening of Annalita and Arcite, comprising lines 1 to 10, 210, in the modern Riverside edition, details the affair between the two and is explicitly set in Thebes. But Annalita's complaint, the second part of Annalita and Arcite, has no Theban setting. It's a lament by a woman to a false lover of the type very commonly seen in contemporary French poetry, as James Wimsett and Cara Doyle have previously suggested. That Shirley is reading this poem in the context of contemporary French lyric, rather than in the Theban context in which modern scholars usually read it, speaks to Tony Edwards' argument concerning the presentation of Annalita and Arcite in the manuscripts. As Edwards notes, Annalita's complaint occurs by itself in four out of 12 extant manuscripts of the poem. In all the other eight, it is always distinctively separated from the Theban section of the poem through rubrics and or visual markers, very visually distinct on the page. <coughs> Moreover, in three manuscripts, the two sections are presented in reverse order. Edwards thus offers a very convincing argument for understanding Annalita and Arcite as actually being two separate poems featuring the same two characters, one set in Thebes and one not set anywhere specific and formally close to contemporary French models. Two separate poems eventually brought together by 15th century scribes rather than originally by Chaucer. Shirley seems in this way to be establishing, indeed scribally curating, a continuity between the French lyrics and Chaucer's own English poem, divorced of its theme context. Strikingly, Shirley does something oddly similar with another set of Chaucer's works, The Complaint of Mars and The Complaint of Venus. Shirley is responsible for linking The Complaint of Mars to The Complaint of Venus in his rubrics, and this linking has long puzzled scholars because Firstly, the rubrics are very weirdly worded, as you're about to see. And secondly, because the complaint of Mars is a mythological poem about the love affair between Mars and Venus that pointedly mentions Thebes. The complaint of Venus, meanwhile, is an unnamed woman's address to her lover that is not set anywhere specific, 
that we know to be a translation from French into English of five poems by Chaucer's French contemporary, Auton de Canson. It does not mention Mars and Venus or have any classical setting. From this perspective, the Theban complaint of Mars and the Frenchified complaint of Venus suddenly strongly resonate with that Theban French division noted above in Annalita and Arcite. These works occur together for the first time in that same Trinity manuscript by Shirley, 12 folios after Annalita's complaint. Indeed, manuscripts of the complaint of Mars and the complaint of Venus overlap very heavily with Annalita and Arcite manuscripts. In Trinity, Shirley introduces Mars as follows. This is number two on your handout. Lo, you lovers, rejoice and enjoy the relationship recounted between the hardy and fierce Mars, the god of arms, and Venus, the false goddess of love, composed by Geoffrey Chaucer. So far, so good. Shirley identifies Mars as being by Chaucer and about the love affair between Mars and Venus. The poem runs for four folios with the running title, and this is 3A on your handout. So the running title is what, sort of the, the header on the top of the manuscript pages. The relationship between Mars and Venus. On page 138, as an explicit to Mars, Shirley writes the following, and this is number four on your handout. Thus ends here this complaint, which some men say was made by my lady of York, daughter to the king of Spain, and my lord of Huntington, sometime duke of Exeter, and following begins a ballad translated out of French into English by Chaucer Geoffrey, the French composed by Sir Atom de Canson, Savoyard Knight. So Mars, Shirley tells us, is a complaint made by my lady of York and my lord of Huntington, two figures since identified as Isabella of York and John Holland, Earl of Huntington, both married to other people and both with a reputation for scandalous behavior according to contemporary chroniclers. Given that the poem Mars is about the adulterous affair between Mars and Venus, surely seems clearly to be implying that Isabella and John were having their own adulterous affair. But having finished discussing Mars, Shirley goes on in this explicate to introduce Venus as a completely new unrelated poem, a ballad translated from French to English by Chaucer. The running title for Venus confirms its total separation in content from the preceding. It reads, and this is number 3b under handout, ballad composed by Chaucer to honor a lady that loved a knight. The poem ends at the bottom of page 141 and at the top of page 142, then reads, this is number five on your handout, it is said that Gonson composed this last ballade for Venus, depicting my lady of York responding to the complaint of Mars. And here follows a ballade composed by Chaucer about the lover and Dame Fortune. This odd link between the two poems has puzzled many scholars because it does not seem to actually make much sense. Shirley appears to be claiming that Gonson's French original depicts Venus's response to Chaucer's complaint of Mars, meaning that Gonson is also writing about the same scandalous affair between Isabel and John Holland and directly responding to Chaucer, who then translates that response back into English, except that this narrative doesn't work. Gonson's French original has a man, not a woman, speaking. Chaucer changed the gender of the speaker in his English translation. So Gonson's poems de facto cannot be Venus's response because the speaker in them is not female. Shirley forges a link between the two poems in this explicate, but it seems illogical. It is not reflected in either of the titles that he gives the two poems, nor in their running titles. It also weirdly serves as a transition into the title of a whole new poem by Chaucer, commonly known as Fortune. And we note that this really odd linking is happening with a poem that Shirley identifies correctly as a translation from French into English by Chaucer. So this seems like a one-off oddball error of some kind, but strange configurations of precisely these works do not stop here. Intriguingly, Shirley links these same poems, The Complaint of Venus and Fortune, together again in another one of his manuscripts, Bodleian Library, Ashmole 59, copied in the late 1440s. On folio 37R, Shirley introduces Fortune with the phrase, this is number six on your handout. Here follows now a complaint of the plaintiff against Fortune, translated out of French into English by that famous rhetorician, Geoffrey Chaucer. This phrase, in its discussion of translation into English, and in its reference to Chaucer as a rhetorician, 
resonates with Shirley's introduction of Annalita's complaint as a work anguished by Chaucer in the most rhetoricious way. What's really odd is that Shirley then copies out Fortune, but concludes it with the wrong envoy. Not the one that it actually contains in all other manuscript copies, but instead with Chaucer's famous envoy to the complaint of Venus, in which Chaucer laments the difficulty of translating from French to English. Uh, this is number seven on your handout. For old age that dulls my spirit has well nigh bereft all the scale of composition from my memory, and also it is a great hardship to me for rhyme in English hath such scarcity, and following word by word the curiosity of Ganson, the best of them who compose in France. Shirley then goes on to copy out Venus six folios later, which he introduces as, this is number eight on the handout, here begins a ballade made by that worthy knight of Savoy in French called Sir Athon de Canson, translated by Chaucer, a very similar rubric to what we saw in Trinity R320. And he ends this version of Venus with its correct envoy. So the same one that he had just copied out some folios previous as the wrong envoy to fortune. Margaret Connolly has pointed out that Shirley seems to have copied Asimov 59 very late in his life when he was around 80 which could explain this evident confusion. But I can't let go of the feeling that it's more than error. It's too weird to me that Chaucer's only explicit discussion of the challenges of translating from eloquent French into good English should appear twice in the same manuscript in two poems that Shirley has already pointedly linked together earlier in his scribal career, and with that word rhetorician that further echoes Shirley's rubric to Annalita's complaint a poem he places after 23 other French works. There are too many connections for this to be error or accident. Interestingly, this odd intersection of the complaint of Mars, the complaint of Venus, and fortune with Annalita's complaint emerges again in a much later manuscript, Cambridge Maudlin College Peaks 2006, dating to the second half of the 15th century. Here, two scribes copy the poems Mars and Venus in sequence both times, but in two separate parts of the manuscript. The first instance, on pages 115 to 24, <clears throat> presents the two poems as a single textual unit, as in several other manuscripts. And this unit is followed by Chaucer's Fortune, just like in Trinity R320. Then towards the very end of the manuscript, on pages 378 to 82, we get the two poems again, new scribe this time, and a mangled 84-line fragment of Mars, followed by a fragment of Venus that is missing its opening 44 lines. These fragments seem to be presented as a single textual unit, with a natural page break separating Mars from Venus, and are immediately followed by, guess what, the complaint from Annalita and Arcite. <laughs> However, the last two lines of this version of Annalita's complaint are actually, guess what, the final two lines of Chaucer's fortune. The resurfacing of this connection between fortune and the Annalita and Arcite and Mars and Venus material suggests that Shirley's scribal influence and curation of these particular Chaucerian items continue to be felt through the 15th century. Certain highly tentative conclusions may be drawn from this somewhat thorny manuscript mess that speaks to the critical importance of the material text in our understanding of the movements of literary history. Firstly, it is clear that Shirley is invested in presenting Chaucer as a translator, especially a translator from French. Moreover, the issue of translation also seems to bring up for Shirley the question of Chaucer's literary merits on the one hand, rhetorician, most rhetoricius, but also, we notice, the question of Chaucer's linguistic difficulties or linguistic alterity, uncouth meters, and that famous modesty topos in the envoy to the complaint of Venus about the scarcity of English, repeated twice in Ashmole 59, it is also clear that Shirley's careful curation of Annalita and Arcite, the complaint of Mars, the complaint of Venus, and Fortune seems to have had some sort of an impact on later scribes. I want to end with one final observation, really, rather than a firm conclusion, since this is very much obviously a work in progress. Shirley's emphasis on Chaucer as a translator also seems oddly localized around Annalita and Arcite on the one hand and Mars and Venus on the other. 
We're used to viewing these as three separate works due to their modern presentation in the Riverside Chaucer. But Shirley and other 15th century scribes seem to treat them as four separate poems, conjoinable into two distinct pairs, but also just as easily separable. Furthermore, these pairs are, when we think about it, oddly balanced. We have the love affair of Annalita and Arcite, set in Thebes. Annalita's complaint, no concrete historical setting, and following contemporary French models. The love affair of Mars and Venus, with an emphasis on the brooch of Thebes. And a woman's address to her lover, no concrete historical setting, and translated from a known contemporary French source. Thebes, Thebes infused love affair, French inspired women's address, both times, a scribal conjunction between the two, both times, and both times in this explicit context of Anglo French translation activity. It strikes me that these conjunctions are not accidental. They speak firstly to Chaucer's own predilection for infusing both classicizing elements, as particularly Theban elements, and French lyric elements into his longer works, like the Book of the Duchess the prologue to the legend of good women, and particularly Troilus and Crusade. And they speak to Duchamp's own praise of Chaucer as a new Seneca, Ovid, and an Aulus Gellius, in the same breath in which he names him as a great translator from French into good English. These moments remind us, in other words, that in the Middle Ages, translation always operates along two axes, the synchronic and the diachronic, reaching back to pull from antiquity as much as it reached across to pull from other contemporary literary traditions. And they also remind us more broadly that Chaucer's scribes, no less than Chaucer's poetic contemporaries, were important early readers, critics, and shapers of his legacy, and that this legacy was at least partly built upon Chaucer's capacity and aptitude for translation from French into English. Can you speak up a little bit? Yeah. You talked about Don Juan Ferris' efforts to try and 
I was training to hear, right? The, the question is uh, whether um, Chaucer or Lydgate um, that uh, Lisa and Sonia spoke about uh, expressed the same kind of anxieties about the preservation of their works um, that uh, John Manuel uh, also articulated. So this is a great question that's been tackled, um, particularly when it comes to Chaucer's work. And why don't I leave the Chaucer part to you and I'll just talk about it. I'm leaving the harder part to you. Um, <laughs> Have fun talking about Adam Scrivain. Oh, oh I have a question for you about Adam. <laughs> <laughs> Look, it's, um, but I will talk about the kid. And um, part of what I'm getting at in my, in my talk, and something that I do want to highlight more, particularly in answer to your question, is that I believe that Lincoln actually did understand that future people were going to come at his text opportunistically. And the, the literary critic and, and scholar, Mara Nolan, has actually written about this, just with respect to the content, not with respect to the manuscripts themselves. And he is famous, like it is, is very famous, among those who know him, uh, for having, quote, sub he, he submits his work humbly to your correction. And this has always been considered a humility topos. But I can assure you, having just sent off another chapter of my book to a colleague to review, that that humility topos is sometimes very real. Um, uh, uh, there's a kind of fear, but also a desire for someone to make this even better. And I've begun to doubt that it is just a topos. I think it was A-OK -okay with people using his works in bottom line. I hope that answers your question with respect to it. I think he would have, yeah, um, in, in a limited way. Absolutely. Um, please, I want to go ahead. Oh, yes. <laughs> the, okay. Uh, <laughs> as briefly as possible. So firstly, that Chaucer is concerned about this is very evident from Trellis and Crusade, uh, where he has a very famous uh, passage where he says, go, little book, go, little book, go out there into the world, and I hope that nobody miswrites or mismeters you, right? That nobody incorrectly copies or incorrectly I think, I think Miss Meter is a very interesting word here. Also, like, incorrectly registers the rhyme and meter of his text, right? So that's a very, very, very famous thing. And um, there's a lot of connections between uh, Trellis and Crusade in particular, and uh, the same Guillaume de Machaut, who was upset, and a lot of connections between Chaucer and Machaut. Uh, Machaut being a, a, a poet that Chaucer knew intimately well, quoted many things from, and Machaut is, like, famously obsessed. And, and all the French people are, the Poissard and Deschamps, they're all obsessed with curating, Pizan, they're all obsessed with curating their own complete works manuscripts, and Chaucer is evidently picking up on this. Except that we don't have really manuscripts from his own period, all of our manuscripts are 15th century. In particular, we have John Shirley, who, as you can see, is obsessed with curating Chaucer, though I would argue, in this very complex and problematic manner. <laughs> and so where this intersects with Lydgate is that um, Shirley also just as obsessively copies Lydgate. In fact, to the point that Tony Edwards, who I mentioned in my talk, is, um, uh, Me Megan and I have actually edited a special essay cluster on, uh, on John Shirley's Trinity manuscript that's going to come out in studies in the age of Chaucer. And um, Edward's argument in that cluster is that Shirley intimately knows Lydgate and is like curating Lydgate for a wider audience and sort of uh, getting Lydgate as he puts it hot off the quill and presenting it to him. And so that Lydgate and Shirley are operating kind of together in this presentation. What I would add to that though is that, so I only talked about Chaucer in my talk, but this chapter is also about Lydgate because as obsessed as Shirley is with telling us when Chaucer translates from French, he's just as obsessed as saying this about Lydgate. In both Ashmole 59 and Trinity, and the third manuscript, additional 16165, and on top of that, he's also he, t he mentions a bunch of other texts that are translated from other languages, including some from diverse languages, into English. So I would say that, um, I would argue that the uh, that the authorial, the 14th century authorial obsession for uh, curating one's own work 
in the 15th century becomes a scribal obsession with elevating English um, and with managing English's relationship with French, Latin, and other languages. Let's talk about English for me. Oh God, see I avoided that very, very carefully. I oh, have a too. too. <laughs> so um, for those of you who might not know Chaucer's poem, um, to the words into his um, own, out of his own scribane. Um, it begins, Adam Scribane, if I've read thee before, Bowies or Troilus, uh, for uh, to write new, um, under thy long locus, thou must have the scale, a lesson to my making, thou write more true, with um, Bowies uh, being Chaucer's translation of um, Bowie Pius's Consolation of Philosophy, and uh, Troilus being Troilus and Crusade, which draws heavily on both, um, uh, well, we'll just, for purposes of this, it also draws on um, Bowie Pius. Um, but on Boccaccio's Bill Philostrato as well. Um, and that appears at the end, this is our only copy of it, at the end of Trinity R320. Uh, um, now, we'll also talk about Tony Edwards, who has recently <laughs> argued that um, that poem is not, in fact, written by Chaucer at all. Um, and he, he has Tony Edwards. This is after a great, uh, Lynn Mooney made this identification found in Adam, who was Adam Pinkhurst, who is a scribe of Chaucer's. Canterbury Tales, and therefore argue that this Adam is is Adam Pinkhurst. But then Kennedy Edwards, who really disagrees with this argument, has said, no, this poem came by Chaucer, I'm sorry. So um, <laughs> thinking about that as an ongoing controversy in Middle English studies, um, and in, in thinking about what it means to be an author in Middle English in general, um, one of the things it came to mind while you were giving your talk, because you focus on the French, right? And uh, so if we're thinking about um, the Bowies and Troilus and Crusade as translations, we're thinking about, on the one hand, uh, something from the Latin, um, on the other hand, something from um, the uh, Italian, or possibly we're thinking about salads and other, there's Latin text in the background there as well. So um, given what you're saying about Chaucer's reputation as a translator of French specifically, um, do you want to weigh in on, on Adam's grenade? And then I want to hear what Sonia has to say. Um, I mean, it's really complicated. So I, I, I don't have a horse in this, I'm not, I, I don't know, I don't know who's right. I don't, I mean, I find Tony Edwards' argument about how this could have been by Chaucer kind of convincing, but I'm not necessarily wedded to it. So I don't know. But I will say what I do find, I, I'm just going to say this. What I do find very interesting is that there is also a text by Chaucer, the prologue to the legend of good women, in which Chaucer is taken to task by the god of love for uh, writing badly of women, firstly, that's what most people focus on, but also for bad translation. And in the defense that Alceste, so he has this female intercessor who inter intercedes for him before the god of love, and she brings up the same two texts. She says, well, actually, Chaucer's done a very good job with, in, with Bo Boes and with Troilus and Crusade, um, which is very interesting. Now, um, specifically what's going on in the prologue to the Legend of Good Women, to my mind, is also, is, is so hovering in the background of all of this is Frenchness, because one of the things that's happening there is that, um, uh, I'll, is that there, there's, a, there's a short poem that's inserted into the prologue to the Legend of Good Women that is very much on the model of contemporary French lyric that cites a bunch of different uh, mythological personae. And the God of Love berates specifically, so in berating Chaucer for being a bad translator, the God of Love also berates Chaucer for not including Alceste into this, into this catalog of famous women. But I, so this is, this is gonna be in my book. What I think is going on here is that um, French, so in including that English poem that looks like a French poem with all these mythographical figures, Chaucer's including a list of traditional mythological figures used in contemporary French poetry. And this traditional French list doesn't include Alceste. Uh, because El El and in particular, uh, Chaucer does something really weird with Alceste and the daisy that is really his own invention. So I think what's going on in the prologue to Legend of Good Women is that French mythology is bad, and that we need to go back to classical mythology, and we need to go back to the older sources, and sort of revive the French-mediated uh, classicism is not doing good things for English literature, and that's what makes Chaucer a bad translator. And that's where Boes and Troilus come in, because they're not, they are translations, they involve 
works from antiquity that are translated from Latin and Italian and that are more distant than French sources. This is sort of a convoluted answer. But I'm sorry about that. But, uh, but basically, um, my, I would say, going back to Adam Scribane, that I think that the Boets and the Troilus are counterpoints to Chaucer, are sort of the, the opposite cases of Chaucer's and So whoever wrote it was whoever wrote it is thinking, keyed into this dynamic. I think so. Yeah. Sorry about that. No, it's very complicated. Um, I, I don't have a horse in the race either, and I'm really looking forward to reading Tony's essay or article. Uh, the only thing that I've noticed in scholarship on Adam Scribine is that there isn't enough of an emphasis on Chaucer's own role as a scribe. He himself has to correct. So he accuses, or he, he actually curses Adam Scribane of so that if he writes, if he miswrites something, he should get you know, an itchy scalp. He'll have to, he'll have to scratch, his, and, he, and then, you know, he should scratch it also because he's flummoxed in a stupid scribe, right? Scratching your scalp. It's something about curse. But then, exactly, Chaucer then says, I must work, re, uh, renew and scrape your work. So Chaucer is also a scribe. Now, I think I want to bring this back, pardon me, to Anita, yes? To Anita, something that you showed, because there is this real uh, in, in interplay, or I, I, I don't think that's quite right, doubling or, or kinship between the author and the scribe. So you show Garcia, or whatever his name is, is being positioned or is hands amounts to the role of um, uh, Obama. 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 Yes. Exactly. So um, I think this is something about Adam Scrovey that people don't comment on as much. And uh, perhaps it wasn't Shirley's interest to, or whichever, whoever the author is, mm -hmm. the author's interest to portray Chaucer in that way, to elevate the role of the scribe, not to mm -hmm. um, talk about the author's own control. Mm -hmm. This is not my field, so please um, forgive my stupidity. Um, but just listening, it seems that the definition of um, mechanical scribe, author, editor, um, are much more fluid to the time that the works that you're speaking of came from than those roles are as we find them today. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's a, there's a great passage in Bomb Adventure that <laughs> that defines the four ways of making a book all on equal footing. Right, you can be a scribe, you can be a compiler, you can be a commentator, or you can be an author. Mm -hmm. The author being the one who writes the greatest proportion of uh, his or her own words. But still, authors are never writing completely their own words and ideas. They're always taking, they're always translating or taking from their traditions. And a lot of authors talk about their own, their, talk not about, some, some talk about mocking, so composing, but a lot of them also talk about compiling. Yeah, and their work. And translate. Yeah, yeah. And, well, go ahead. I would just say Lydia is a really great example of yeah. it. Yeah. And, and something I show in the book that I'm writing, I have a chapter on, um, a lot, it's a lot of archival stuff about the role of illuminators in the manuscripts trade between 1403 and 76 in London. And what I found in going through records is that illuminators and scribes are often one and the same. Uh, there isn't even a separation between craft. So uh, we do have a great fluidity. And um, just going back to the question I was asking you about author images, uh, we see in this period of representations that elide the rules of uh, copying, illuminating, and composing. They, they all complete them. So just to work, so that would strengthen the argument that there is a great deal of importance to looking at the physicality of these texts as well as the actual words themselves, and how they're they get down to us is that context is important to the discussion. Can I ask you a question about the, presumably the book that you are talking about now exists in its complete form. And this may be a little bit more technical than these. Uh, but how do you figure, how do they figure out which images occur, are, are made when? Are there differences in That image? is a fantastic question. So um, for those of you who may not have heard, how did they, meaning scholars, I suppose, scholars. when images, well, this is the connoisseurial act, which is a philological mm -hmm. act, right? <laughs> we look at those images and we decide what periods they resemble. Now, the answer to the question regarding the early 16th century images, they're all wearing Tudor fashions with the square mm -hmm. necklines. 
those, the, nobody wore clothing like that. Yeah. Now, then, this is why your, your question is so fascinating. The images that were added circa 1490, they could be from around 1460 when the original portion, they're not all that different, they're, they're close enough. Remember how I said that they were misbound? That they were, remember that they were put in the 16th century when the book was painted again? Uh, and remember how they were not contiguous. So they were painted around 1490, but they're in different places in the manuscript. I think that the people who were updating this manuscript in the 16th century were executing a similar commissarial act. The person wasn't really paying attention to his work. He saw those images from the 1490s and went, oh, it's a different time period. They all belong together. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Yeah, so um, someone in the 16th century was doing the same thing that people like me have done. They looked at them and went, those go together. Does that make sense? Yes. But anyway, that's how, how we know when they were made. I hope I'm answering the your question. Really the oh, well, so the whole entire manuscript, the two core portions that were left unfinished, uh, one scribe, possibly two scribes, but very similar, very characteristic mid-15th century. The added portions are um, a hand that tries to look similar to the earlier ones, but it's absolutely 16th century. Um, when you look at it paleographically, you can tell. <laughs> I think so, too. <laughs> we have time for a few more questions. Okay. Oh. <laughs> you guys have yeah. another, <laughs> I, you have another question? Um, while the context of the manuscript, you said obviously not the book is sort of but how exactly was it sort of You wouldn't have been bound to the book, right? They just messed up the box and pulled it off. So uh, books were commonly um, disbound in order to be updated or to have a new binding put on it. So that's a pretty common practice, and one of the reasons why we know, well, we know it's a common practice just because we see manuscripts that have been messed around with in a way that you would have to just find them, uh, but also trimming. So every time uh, you want to put a book in a new binding, you want to make sure the pages fit in your new gorgeous binding, so you trim those pages, which happens a lot, uh, although not that much with this manuscript. Uh, uh, but you said, how do I know that it wasn't just sitting on a shelf, or uh, what was it for? Oh, how was it stored? Oh, it was almost certainly um, would have been shown on a, if not oh, you know, always on display. Uh, the Percy's had this library where uh, the books were placed on what would now be called like, carriages or, or ponies. Um, and you would read it upright. You wouldn't just hold it. It's like a lectern. A le like a lectern. Thank you. I'm losing my English. Uh, and it would have been much more of a display item. Or you'd have to, you can't read this in bed. <laughs> it's heavy. Uh, and just to sort of follow up though, but um, sort of the reason why we have so many issues with the transmission of jobs for smaller works, the lyrics, fortune, Venus, yeah. Mars, Annalise, complaint, etc. The reason why it's all so fragmented is actually because, unfortunately for me, given what I work on, lyric poetry was not bound. Lyric poetry was scribbled yeah. in a, on a lot of fly leaves, scribbled at the ends of manuscripts, or just kept, we know this from inventories, kept in unbound sort of little folders. And as we know, folders disintegrate very easily. And so we've lost so much lyric poetry and our uh, knowledge, uh, that's why some of the like Shirley becomes so important for Chaucerians, precisely because that archive is more fragmented almost than any other in the, in the 14th and even 15th century. Sucks for us. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe one more question. I did have a question. I had a question for you as to um, how exactly Juan Manuel. I read the Quan of the Penal, but I can't remember. How does he? Does he talk about himself as an outer a poet, a compilator? Like what word does he use? Because he's so obsessed with curating his own self. So how does he talk exactly. about his poetic endeavors? Um, he refers to himself by his, his normal titles, um, but he also uh, refers to himself as the one who made the book, and uh, you see this in French and English. Fasser. Oh, Fasser. Yeah. Oh, um, Fasser. Oh, Fasser. With the, with the so, but, like, a yeah. marker. Um, yes. Uh, Does Fasser have the same uh, valence that to make has, or, or polysemy that it has in English, which is you could be pies, you could be literally craft? Yes. So, and he never uses the word outdoor to refer to himself. Oh, so, um, so that, that's very perfect.